morning. There it is. Good morning. I think the last time it was just the three of us, we were on Talon. <laughs> Talon? <laughs> Are you there? You guys can just flash the lights a little bit. <laughs> Talon will be taking questions and he'll be signing autographs. <laughs> just over at the Marriott. <laughs> That was one of my first sort of real, it felt like a really silly sci-fi moment where I'm talking to a ship. <laughs> Tell them, you've got to focus. <laughs> no, no, you have to focus. <laughs> that was all scripted. <laughs> you know, in other professions, you, you know, you go to work and you talk to the walls, you get carried away. <laughs> and it's a trade jacket. Tell him. He, he talks to the wall, tell him. <laughs> that set was hot too, all those lights, because there were so many <laughs> sort of lights behind all of the opaque panels. And we would sit there waiting for the crew to set up for the next shot. And I have a, an image of me and Ben just sitting up against the sort of very angular bulkheads, just kind of. Yeah, it was kind of like a toaster oven. <laughs> you know, the little coils. Depending on the scene, they turn it to broil. Congratulations, everybody. You made it to day four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here, at whatever hour it is in the morning, I know in LA it's seven in the morning, so. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I was going to sleep last night, trying to go to sleep last night, and I was hearing bagpipes in the distance. <laughs> Were any of you there? No, that was her. <laughs> she raised her hand. I asked me. You, know. <laughs> you heard? Yeah, and it reminded me of last time I was here, <laughs> dragging on bagpipes in the morning. Well, I have a feeling I know one of the people who was responsible because I had a photo up the other day with a stormtrooper in a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> the Scottish contingent. <laughs> they, were, they were holding the, high, the, the sci fi Highland Games. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're getting the caber. <laughs> it, was, it was actually, they had, a, uh, <laughs> they had an R2D2 toss. <laughs> It was Troy wrestling. <laughs> Atlanta's a happening place. They had NASCAR this weekend. They had college football. Yes. They had baseball. What are you people doing here? <laughs> Don't forget, Britney Spears was here on Friday night as well. <laughs> In a kilt. Oh look, there they go. <laughs> They're actually leaving. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Thank you for getting up this early on Monday. For the what? Getting up this early on oh. Monday. <laughs> Wait, it's Monday? Yeah. <laughs> I, I seriously started thinking it was Sunday. <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit about Lonnie and what it was like for him to play two characters. And that got me thinking about the uh, series of episodes where there are two Crichtons. And I was wondering if you guys would be willing to talk a little bit about how that affected you and, I mean, Ben obviously having to play himself twice. Um, but also for Lonnie and Claudia um, interacting with both of the Crichtons and how you sort of distinguish between them and what the process was for dealing with that. Well, first I can say I never thought it was possible to be jealous of myself. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it was supremely disconcerting. <laughs> 
you know, one episode she's happy to be with me, the next episode she's ignoring me. It was, that, it was, it was like marriage. junior high school of high school all over again. <laughs> marriage, isn't it, honey? <laughs> Pass me the toast, you've ruined my life. <laughs> I was thinking of the episode when you started talking, I was thinking of my three crisis. That's oh, no. where my mind went. That was one of your favorite episodes, honey. Oh yeah, I love that one. <laughs> she wasn't talking about that one. No, okay. So what was the experience like working with the two Crichtons? Um, I thought it was such excellent storytelling and I'm a big... I feel like I'm a, a detective of drama. I'm always looking for the juiciest way to tell the story, what's going to hurt the most to perform and what's going to, you know, affect people the most deeply. Or hurt me the most. No, that was never my objective. I just want to cause the audience pain and myself pain. No, but I mean, if it really is a love story, which as we've, we've talked about before, um, What's, what's going to make us feel the most profoundly about each choice we make as actors for these characters. And when we did Icarus Abides, I mean, that was such a, on one hand, a delicious opportunity as an actor, and heartbreaking because I'd become so invested in, in the relationship on behalf of my character. And, um, you know, even though as an actor, you, unless you're very method about your process, you don't want to go through the things that your, your character's going through, but you do take some of it home with you, I think. And um, just making a decision on the day with Ian Watts and the director, he said, okay, and so he dies, and you close his eyes, and then you walk off, and we have a wide shot of him alone in his bed. And some directors plan, and they have everything worked out, and, and it, it helps get the day done. But I just said to him, I really feel very strongly that I would cuddle up next to him and tuck myself in. She's just not ready to, to let go. Um, and it became for me, every time I watch it, it kills me. That scene is just, to me, that felt like where the, where the scene needed to go. And for me, that was the combination of everything we've done, splitting the two, you know, the Crichtons and, and how far we could take that love story. Um, and then that, then for me, was sort of, it was a weird springboard or a bookend, I'm not quite sure which, but seeing Crichton for the next time on the ship and just him being so excited he's running down the corridor and he comes down and he's so excited to see Aaron and she's just cold as ice. And that was a tough moment, a really tough moment to film because as a person, seeing, seeing that energy running into the room and rejecting it, I mean, that, I, that affected me personally, but... Um, so I'll always remember those, those two filming moments specifically, based on the fact that Crichton had been separated into two. He was such a teenage boy, wasn't he? I know, it was so beautiful what Ben was doing, and I just felt awful. I felt worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has anybody here not seen these episodes we're talking about? Oh, we were ruined it for her! Oh, look at that! It's much better when you actually see it than the way we tell it. <laughs> <laughs> we just wrecked it for them. Because that was one of the things that I hadn't realized um, until our panel the other day when, when we asked for a show of hands is how many people were new to the series. And for those of you who have been with the show from the beginning, God bless you. <laughs> Because it would be impossible for new people to be coming to the series without you guys going, you haven't seen Farscape? And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, promote anything, but keep doing that. <laughs> it really is wonderful that, that more people are finding this series, Farscape, because it, it, is, it, it is truly a unique piece of television, I think. And, uh, you know, it, but we're not getting residuals on anything that gets that, that gets seen. But it, I just think it's so great that you guys are um, proselytizing. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. You know, the most uh, interesting thing was when we first started that the people, the, the supporting actors, were coming in on the show that they had no idea um, what startup was, and so. They had to run with 
the way that we were playing things. I mean, it was pretty much Shakespearean in a way, where everything that you were doing was was incredibly big um, and passionate with it, as a piece of Shakespearean text is. And that's the way we, I think. Well, that's the way that I approached it, and I was talking to to Ricky Manning. And so. You know, for the show, when people were coming and they were, they were kind of trying to work out whether it was Star Trek or, or what it was, but they were constantly seen coming up against these amazing creatures that were developed in the, in the kind of creature shop and prosthetics, and so they had to run with us in the way that we were re reacting on the set. It wasn't an easy process, and especially as they had, it hadn't been on air yet, so they, there was no reference point for them. And it was a weird climate in television in Australia at the time because there were a couple of key television shows that had adopted a particular type of style of acting that came through David Mamet and um, practical aesthetics and it's this whole naturalism where you, you prove how diligently you're listening to the other actor in the scene by repeating what they're saying. So, you're looking at me. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. No, I'm looking you at are looking at me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and Andrew Krause had just come from doing this show where everyone was like, oh my god, it's such raw TV, everyone's really reacting and you know, it was so raw that when the steady cam would sort of pan down, sometimes you'd see the actors marks on the floor of the set and you know they'd be like, Oh, it's amazing, it's cutting edge TV. And Andrew wanted to bring that across to Farscape. And he was saying, you know, you know, let's let's ignore the construct. This is all about ignoring the construct and being really real and present in the moment. But you can't, you can't say, hey, trail tax, you're for botting and yachting and looking at my Hesmanaric Frillington look. Dramaturg to give us acting lessons <laughs> so that we could really embrace this style. And Ben and Anthony had the sort of the confidence and the training. They'd been to proper drama schools and they said, Oh, stuff this, I'm not doing it. Forget it. Thank you, I know what I'm doing, and you know, I mean, I'll, yep. Um, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> but I know, it's like, no, but, but I did, I did. He would say, Okay, so, so uh, you know, basically, what's your motivation? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no, you, you, what, what do you want? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Andrew Brown, you got to understand, Andrew's, Andrew's six foot three, big Aussie blind from down in South Australia. <laughs> and he was like, no, you got to tell me. Uh, no, I'm not telling you. And we went back and forth and the other people were like, oh God, we got this. Jerk. <laughs> the director is trying to help us and he's impeding the process and he's the lead of the show. And I said, well, I just said, look, I don't want you judging what I'm thinking, I want you judging what I'm doing. And he just threw his hands up. We walk outside, I'm standing outside the, the sound stage, and I look at him, and, and he looks at me, looks down at me, <laughs> and I say, what is it about you that makes me want to hit you? <laughs> Balls up his big Aussie fist. Yeah, we're gonna get on just fine. <laughs> that one was good, but there was, you know. I remember one rehearsal like that. That was the only one that had ever happened because from then on I was like, you know, yeah, so you're looking at me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was like Shakespeare, you can't just improvise. There's a whole world of language that just doesn't make it easy to adopt that style and then you know, the dramaturg took me out for a coffee she said look, look let's just have a chat i don't think this is really going to work on this show but let's just go out and have a chat and then at least we can tick that box and tell andrew that we tried so we go out to this coffee shop and there's these big low windows it was on oxford street and there were these big low windows and she said i'm just going off to the restroom and this guy had come up um a homeless guy had come up and started talking to me and he went Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm gonna come back. <laughs> and that was the only bit I heard him. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Off he went. 
lady goes to the bathroom, she comes back, and he returns, and he hands me money through the window. And the whole staff stopped, everyone stopped in the restaurant and said, well, that's a first. And I said, I think we're done here, and we're just going to go back to set. I don't think anything else that's more interesting is going to happen today. I'll use it. I'll use it on set, I promise. Um, but yeah, as you say, I think in the end it became about it being, you know, it was an epic tale and the stakes needed to be high and I think a lot of what happens in science fiction and in action genre is that people, the actors don't play the stakes because everyone's been too cool for school and the biggest problem with that is that the, the, the drama dies. So for us it was about making the most out of the drama every day. <coughs> Yeah. Next question. Hey. Just shout it out. Yeah, use my best hey. Shakespearean voice. Uh, okay. Hey. Um, actually, speaking of Shakespearean, I wanted to, to hear a little bit more about your uh, theater background. Uh, and if you guys have any projects in the works, uh, if you want to delve back into that, that theatrical realm, uh, and if so, in what capacity? Sorry, that's totally not Farscape stuff. But you guys are great. Oh, uh, no, not at all. No, no, as long as it's about us, we don't care. <laughs> That's it. There's, there's 
they, there's all kinds of technical considerations which come in, so for holding it in your head, the Shakespeare is good. Um, now, would I like to do another play? Was that part of the question? I, would, I think I would love to be back on stage. Hey, wait, I'm on stage now. <laughs> I'll put on some tights, honey, and a cut piece. <laughs> You wear it, they'll come. <laughs> we happy to be band of brothers. Each day that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Ah, the gentlemen in England now in bed shall so hold themselves accursed and think that that's cheap. As any speech is fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. It is scary what works in the recesses of an actor's brain. <laughs> Claudia? Oh, I dried on stage. I was playing Portia in Merchant of Venice doing a tour. Drying for you non anglo sized people means she forgot her lines. And it was I never did that on Parscape, by the way. <laughs> Quit prompting me, woman! <laughs> I mean, when the curtain goes up, that's it. And with Shakespeare, there is, I mean, unless you are brilliant, which I absolutely am not, there is little improvising to be done. You just have to find a way to get through it. The problem for me was that I dried in the middle of one of the most famous speeches Shakespeare ever wrote. I said, the quality of mercy is not strained. <laughs> Well, and then my brain started to find something, but as it was starting to find the words in the wrong order with the wrong prepositions, <laughs> someone in the back row went... <laughs> it dropped to the rain from the place beneath. <laughs> It is twice blessed. And as I kept going, it, my internal monologue was, Dear Lord, make this stop. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't done theatre since then. I did come from a musical theatre background and a theatre background. I didn't do theatre again for a very long time. I ran into someone who said, Oh, remember we did that play together? And I said, Yeah, yeah. He said, Remember that time when you could Completely forgot your line. And I said, You weren't with me in that play. He said, No, remember the one we did, um, Loose Ends by Michael Weller or whatever it was. And I said, When did I forget my line? He said, Oh my God, it was devastating. <laughs> and I said, What are you talking about? And he said, Well, the guy you were doing the scene with completely, and then he, he you know, he, it wasn't me actually that had forgot the line, but he said, The guy you were doing the scene with completely forgot his line, screwed the whole scene up. And you were so shocked that you didn't know what to do, so you stood there silently for a minute, and then you went <gasps> and walked off stage. <laughs> and I swear to you all that I have no recollection whatsoever of that. And I thought, wow, I either suffer from narcolepsy or complete denial, and I don't think I really deserve to be on stage. But I've just finally, very bravely, and on a whim, auditioned for improv theatre, and that's what I'm currently doing now, is improvisational theatre. <laughs> Help me get through that little mental block issue. There's also the, that wonderful moment where you, when you're doing schools, uh, Shakespeare in schools, and you begin your speech, and you take a pause and you go, to be, and you hear in the distance, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, Kate 
uh, people have gone back to sort of try and reinvigorate the theatre scene in, in Sydney because it does become about, as Ben described on Broadway, bums on seats. And so you have the Blue Rinse Brigade who comes in for the matinees, and then you have the school tours. So they specifically choose they choose their plays that they're doing for the year based on what the schools are studying, so that they know that they can guarantee an audience. And you know, during the winter is when the, sort of the season sort of is in its you know, the crux of it, and, and every time you're on stage, every single performance, it's... <coughs> <coughs> and that's all you hear, it just keeps sort of coming in the age. <laughs> and then you have a little Hungarian couple that I manage to sit behind in every movie when I'm back in Sydney, and he's very deaf, and she has to sort of repeat everything. <laughs> What did he say? <laughs> he said... What did he say? <laughs> uh, live theatre. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> there, okay. Um, one of the great things about being a science fiction fan in this day and age, and thank you to all of you, by the way, for pouring so much talent and effort into what is still the best and most underappreciated science fiction show. Well, it's appreciated by the right people. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I love we don't really feel underappreciated. Yeah, not at all. Where are you guys? Well, one of the great things about being a fan in this day and age is we have the vast resources of the internet at our beck and call, especially right at home where we don't have to interact with other people. <laughs> <laughs> and we can go to imdb.com and see what other fantastic things that you guys have been doing. And I did this, uh, this is a quick question for Claudia. I got a hold of, this way, a, a DVD of something called Stolen Life, which was this crazy, cool little animated project where you played a, I guess, a little robot that was running around. I was just curious, how did you get involved in that? Where, what was the, you know, origin of that little project? Do you know Jackie Lally? Jackie Lally? Jackie Jackie Yeah, Jackie Lally. Don't talk while they talk. Well, Lani also knew the, one of the director and producers of the project. Um, I received a call through my agent, um, an email, saying that they had a, there was a project um, that had been written by Peter Rasmussen, who a, a, was a wonderful Australian screenwriter. Um, and he had done a film that, I, that had opened the Sydney Film Festival, I think around 98 or 99. And um, so I knew of his work, and they sent me the screenplay and asked me, they said, we'd love you to play this role, we really, we know your voice, we love Farscape, and um, we really feel that you would be the right voice for this, for this character. And I read it, and it's a really lovely story about these robots who are in on a, on a they've been posted out on the station, um, and they've been forgotten about. And it's that whole sort of idea, of, oh, I've got chills thinking about it, this whole idea of artificial intelligence and, and whether these beings actually have a, a soul and feelings and what their real objective is. And um, it turns out that these robots out on this station have, have, they do all have their own agenda. And it's a sort of a detective noir story that takes place. Um, very sadly, um, and a little ironically, Peter took his own life shortly after completing the film. Um, so I'm really hoping that that movie finds a voice. Jackie is obviously devastated. They put a lot of uh, work and love into that piece. And it really deserved an audience. So I'm really hoping, I know they screened it, I think, at a convention a couple of years ago. It was here. So um, he, he was a very, very talented and soulful writer. And I really hope that... Um, he was also, the interesting thing about that piece was that he had embraced um, a technology and a, and a form of animation called machinima, 
Um, is there a show, can I have a show of hands beside this row of lovely ladies here who have heard of the medium? Fantastic. Uh, so he was, he'd heard about it, in fact, for those of you who don't know, it's about you can see, um, uh, platforms from games and then making your own animations uh, with the software. So he, he made it what he referred to as a crude animation film using this, this platform and um, I, I hope it's a growing industry. I haven't actually sort of been searching online for Machinima in a while, but um, I assume it's, it's growing in popularity as we speak. Not so good for live action actors. It's not so good for us. <laughs> They've replaced us with the guys from Halo. <laughs> But they still need your voice, your wonderful voice. <laughs> I don't know about that. There is, some, there is cool machinima out there, though. Just do Google machinima, you'll find some really interesting stuff. The adventures of Bill and Ted. I recommend it. I like, I like the fact that people, I, I think the, the, level, the playing field has been leveled in terms of being a storyteller. If you can find a way to tell your story in a visual way, with a low budget, why not? I mean, all power to you, and if the story resonates, it'll get seen, it'll get heard, it'll get appreciated, and you haven't had to, you know, knock on doors for ten years to find a studio to, to, to make their version of your story. So, that's, that's what I like about it. Yeah, it's very cool. Hi, uh, this is my first con, and I was so delighted that Ben, you were going to be here. Um, and Lonnie. And Lonnie, yes. I'm oh, sorry. and, and uh, I just have to say very, very quickly, Virginia um, Hay had to catch a plane, but what she wanted to leave a message with you was, thank you for spoiling her. Wow. Yes. Yes. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for all of the years that the <coughs> first gave him from the beginning, and the um, raw emotion as that you took with the chances with your characters. Uh, the stories that you told to us were, the emotion was, it always translated across the screen as to how invested you were in what was really going on. And I can only imagine the difficulties you faced filming with things that aren't really talking back to you sometimes. <laughs> um, but my question was, um, what about the webisodes? They're, they're talking them back up again, and I understood they were brought up at uh, the Comic-Con. Can you tell us anything? It's all been said. <laughs> well, um, briefly, uh, the webisodes, there are uh, X number of scripts for the webisodes which have been written. Uh, Rock O'Bannon and Ricky Manning from the show uh, have been working on the scripts, with, along with Brian Henson. They were set to shoot the webisodes, uh, and Brian had the money, and then uh, November of last year, I think the stock market did not uh, respond favorably. So it, it, it's an economic question. Brian Henson desperately wants to do more Farscape, and I've had discussions with him about that. It is simply a question of raising the appropriate funds so that they're not trying to do it cheap. If the, the next thing of Farscape needs to be equal to or better than the last thing of Farscape. So that, the, the, the Henson Company definitely wants more Farscape. It is only going to be a question of time and money. Yeah, and Rockney had said that he had hoped, in, in their minds, it, it, the, the show would pick up where Peacekeeper Wars left off. So that, if that gives you some context. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I just look. Comic books, you get to find out what happens next in Farscape. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. You should see what they do to our baby. <laughs> it's, it's not good. <laughs> She's crying. <laughs> next question. I have a question from season one. Uh, in one of the first episodes, um, you are all the characters are all rudely awakened, 
And um, Aaron shows up in John's underwear. And so my well, Were you here yesterday? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I was. Uh, on the Stargate panel yesterday, they asked what we have from, uh, I have, they asked if we stole any props. I have those underwear. <laughs> They'll be on sale in the dealer room. <laughs> oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> well, so my, my first question is, is, how did Aaron get the underwear? And my second part of that question is, what was John wearing? Because we know he didn't pack a bag when he went on car <laughs> I can, I, I can sort of answer part of that question, um, and then I guess Claudia will have to answer the other question as to how she got it. Um, at a certain point, we, we realized we are on this ship, which was a peacekeeper ship, and we came to the conclusion that they would have had stores on the ship, not sort of, but you know, there would be remaining peacekeeper uniforms and whatever else on the ship, and since Sebations are anatomically similar to, to humans, uh, either John got underwear from a commerce planet or there were older uniforms on the ship. I always wondered about the ship's laundry myself. <laughs> because, it, you know, it, given the fact that you're generally in the same clothes, you know, after a while, what do we watch? And so they showed that, and, you know, and, and then they, they showed that in that one episode with the big goo that that Chiana, that Chiana got stuck in. Crackers don't matter, right? That was the episode. Wow, that's scary. I remember that stuff. <laughs> so the, you know, the writers were kind of dealing with those questions, and 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 when uh, when Aaron showed up in Crichton's underwear, I I did say, what am I wearing? <laughs> Yeah, we had to go through the whole issue of not being able to say Calvin Klein, but we wanted to make it clear when she says, oh, but the, you know, and she doesn't speak English, she's getting in the translator microbes to understand him, so, and everyone else, so, so she can't read English, so how does she know, so we have some slightly tweaked dialogue, well, they're somebody else's, aren't they? Those are mine. Well, what does this say? Calvin! <laughs> So <laughs> then they're not yours. <laughs> yeah. um, but when you were asking the question, it made me think about something I'd read about Carrie Fisher when she did the first Star Wars. They told her that there was no need for her to wear a bra because of the gravity situation in space. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs>
And that was the, we were shooting the final episode of the season when we found out. So, we were shooting bad timing. Right. <laughs> so we were in very dark moods at that point. <laughs> So it was hard, you know, and it's like, what? So uh, I can't remember, well, we actually, we thought, well, that's fitting that we get decorporealized at the last image of the, you know, I mean, it just was, it was horrible because, you know. Yeah, we had, we had shot that scene. The question was whether we shoot a, a different ending. One. No, we refuse. We're too pissed off. <laughs> this is what you get. We're holding the ending, ending ransom until you give us more money to finish the show. But it was, it was amazing. I was in, um, in a convention in Las Vegas and someone came up and said, how do you feel about the show finishing? And I just flown out from Australia, and I went, sorry? <laughs> what, uh, come again? She said, oh, oh, sorry, you don't know? And I went, no. <laughs> and this was a Saturday, going, uh, no, <laughs> I don't know anything about this. And then so, uh, I'm still waiting for the call. <laughs> <laughs> that was like that Sorry. woman that found out she was Sorry. getting a divorce on Facebook. Did you guys hear about that? Sorry. There was a woman who found out she was ha ha getting a divorce on Facebook. <laughs> oh, no. Because of her husband's status update and his, his marital status. He changed oh, it. Looking at something new. <laughs> oh no, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, Twitter would, Twitter would be one, one level worse. <laughs> yes! <laughs> At least Facebook has pictures. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your actual question, um, I, I, as I'd said the other day, I, I felt worst for David Kemper because that world was in his head. He had strong ideas about where it would go. Um, and as terrifying as it is for a showrunner to constantly, you know, surprise audiences and, and weave plots and structure things in a way that are going to, you know, sort of, you know, take the story into interesting places and yet hold some level of continuity for the characters. <coughs> he, he certainly had a picture, a very strong image in his head of how the show would end. And so, I mean, it was an incredible opportunity when Peace People Wars came up to at least give David and the fans an opportunity to, to have a, a more peaceful resolution to that that particular arc. Um, but there are still so many more stories to tell, I think we all... Yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of stories left to tell. Yeah. As to ones in particular, um, I, I kind of think it would be very interesting to see to see Crichton and Aaron as parents. <laughs> Just because, it, it, you know, you don't... One of the, one of the things that... that uh, you argue about in a writing room. There's the um, the notion that you can never put your two leads together. Never. And if you put your two leads together, the romance dies. Well, we put them together. We may have broken them up, but we put them together. And it's fairly apparent in most of season four that they're kind of together. It, and I don't think it hurts the show at all. In fact, I think it makes the show more interesting. And given the fact that most of Hollywood, if they're going to deal with family situations, they only deal with it in a comedic way or in a soppy way, I think it would be very interesting to see Farscape's take on marriage and children. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that said, though, they did have this incredible, this brilliant construct through which we could, you know, have her fall in love with one, have him die. And then have to, you know, that creates an incredible mechanism for, for a reset with the, with the other crimes. So, I mean, not with it, had it not been science fiction, we wouldn't have been able to get away with that. So, I think I thought that was a brilliant solution to the romantic, you know, what can often be a romantic problem. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make it drop in viewer friendly. Yeah. Wait a minute, weren't they together last episode? Yeah. <laughs> Why are they doing this now? I don't. Didn't he die? Wait a minute, there's two of them. Yeah. Hang on a second. <laughs> I have to go on the internet just to understand this. <laughs> Next question. Yes, this is for Ben. Um, what are your next projects that you're going to be doing? And also, have you um, been in touch with your high school alumni association yet? <laughs> I, have been in, I have not been in touch with my high school alumni situation. Um, 
it's just a little scary, that's all. I know. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's like, um, don't, aren't most people kind of afraid of their high school alumni situation, or is it just me? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I, I, it's desperately um, disconcerting. <laughs> Wait a minute. They're, they're running Goldman Sachs. <laughs> You've got all your hair. That's a big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? That's what I hear. My husband's got nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I didn't think about that. Um, Do you want me to go with you to your next high school reunion? <laughs> shooting a movie, and that was Queen of the Damned, I think, so I thought, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, still in touch with the people who, I, as far as I'm concerned, count, but um, it's weird. I mean, I'm watching my kids now thinking, oh, those poor dears. I mean, you want to protect them from the experiences that you had at school, and there's no way around it. You just have to be there at dinner time to sort of pick up the pieces, and hope that you can bandage them up well enough for the next day. Um, but uh, in terms of projects that I'm doing, there's a, an animation that I did, a, f a film that I think it's not going to come out until 2011. The working title is Rango, um, and it's with Johnny Depp and Gore Verbinski directed it, who did the Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff, and I play a, a French character 
called Angelique. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And we performed it like a play, but we also filmed it on camera so that the animators could capture our full performances. And it was a huge cast. It was a great experience. Um, Gore wrote it, co-wrote it, but it's his story. Um, and, uh, and the animation, it's just incredible. I think the images that they were sort of what they would reveal because it's very top secret. Um, the animation is sort of, it's at, at a whole new level. It's really incredible um, and it's a comedy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it all comes together. And um, yeah, my PS3 game, Uncharted 2, comes out. Yeah. And, and you know what? Let's <laughs> talk about full circle. Um, I get a text message from a, a Mr. Browder Jr about a month or so ago, asking me if I can send him the beta codes for the game. <laughs> Claudia rates very highly in my house. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that makes me cool in his world, but it was just so funny because I thought, I said, I texted him back and I said, yes, I am just going to have to check that that's okay with your dad. <laughs> Very odd. <laughs> Welcome to parenting. I don't know if this is appropriate for you. Yeah. I don't know if your dad would be happy about this. <laughs> I said yes. <coughs> yeah. Because <laughs> dad wanted to hit the online version, you know. <laughs> Five minutes? It has not been five minutes. They, they put up a big panel saying how many times we have. 300 to seconds. We can bend time. time. <laughs> <laughs> the next question. Hi. Um, I'm going to do an advocacy quest sort of thing and you don't have to answer it, but um, Farscape lives on on the internet and we talk it to that. And one of the things we've talked about in season four tonally being very different from the other seasons. And I was wondering whether that was planned, like the makeup's different, the tone, the way that it's shot, it's a lot darker, um, or whether that was just something that happened from, I don't know, can you talk about that? I think it suited our sensibilities, but it was also a directive from the top. Bonnie Hammer had said, make it edgier, sexier, darker. Um, and the proof was in Battlestar Galactica that came after us, I think. That's my opinion. Really? I, 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 it's, I think that season four, um, like every season of, of Farscape, had a different kind of feel about it. And season five, if there had been one, uh, would have also been it, its own entity. Uh, you know, it, there was um, there was a synergistic quality that occurred with where people were, what was going on. Um, I mean, I, I do think that, that season four uh, had um, was not as cohesive as seasons two or three, in my opinion. I think that there were some some strange kind of things. Some, I think that there were a couple of a couple of balls that were juggled and dropped, in my opinion. That's not to denigrate it in relation to it, because I think there were some great episodes in season four. Um, but like all TV series, they 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 kind of ebb and flow, and they're subject to they're subject to a dynamic which is particularly human, in that we do our best work, and sometimes our work is great, and sometimes it's not as great. I think whereas I think there are great episodes in season four, I don't think that it stacks up to seasons two and three in the overall quality. And, it, I, and I don't know that it was all planned. I think some of it has to do with just the way that humans work as a society and as artists and, and things like that. Uh, if there was a plan, no one informed me. <laughs> this time we're gonna do something different. I mean, in a way we were always trying to do something different. So it, 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 in, in, in the sense that we embrace the notion that uh, the, the why not do it? Why not? Why not split Crichton's? Why not do this? Why not do that? We were inevitably going to have our share of failures. 
where we stepped over a line and went, boom, we just offended, you know, we, we were constantly offending one section of the fan, fan one section of fans, or, or another, you know, it, it was an inevitable thing, you know, that if we killed a character, we offended somebody, <laughs> and not just the actor playing them. But, but you never found the body. That's right. And, and season five, the search for Christ. <laughs> to uh, present a little video clip that we couldn't show on the big screen due to some compatibility issues, but I thank the Dragon Con staff for it. I'd like to show this to uh, uh, Claudia and Lonnie to see what their impressions might be if this were to be an unofficial roast of Ben Browder, that then 1983 Furman College football player. Trait 
was that she was stubborn and her best trait was that she was moody. Uh, <laughs> um, what I really loved about Erin was her, was her vulnerability, so that was the, the key to opening her up, but it was also her Achilles heel. So for me it was such a, an honour to play a character that started like this. You know, ben, ben likened me at one point to a, well, I likened myself to a cactus at one point on set. And he said, you're like a desert flower, uh, a desert, yeah, a desert flower in the right conditions, you bloom. Um, do you remember that? <laughs> a little bit prickly, pretty low maintenance, <laughs> a little bit of water, out comes the flower. So I think, and I think that's sort of like Erin, she was sort of rough on the outside and and a lot more gentle than one would have thought on the inside. So we will tweet from Ben's next high school reunion and let you know how it's going. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here.